Okay, so um, anyone know who this painting is by? Did someone answer? So this is a painting that's in New York. Um, I highly recommend going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art to see it. Um, and for anybody who's interested in painting, uh, who's genuinely interested in painting, continuing to painting or engaging with the painting in their lives, uh, if you haven't been to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, again, I highly recommend it, especially if possible as we're doing this class, because as you start to learn some of the basic fundamental aspects of painting, looking at paintings and seeing how some of these great artists made use of the techniques and principles we're gonna be studying can be extremely useful and can really clarify um, what, we're, what we're learning and maybe what, what some of us are struggling to learn. So anyway, this is a painting by Vermeer, uh, who was a 17th century Dutch painter. His last name is spelled V-E-R-M-E-E-R. -E -E and I'm showing this painting, first of all, I think it's a great painting. Uh, it's what, certainly one of my favorite paintings in, in New York. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this painting later in the semester. Um, he's doing something in this painting with light that will be very important to us in this class. So how is Vermeer, if you all look at this painting, how is Vermeer using light? How is he thinking about light in this painting? He's using the window as a light source. He's using the window as a light source, right. So he's very conscious of the fact that he has a single light source, right? So there's light coming in the window and there's no other light source in this painting. So how do we know that? Like, why do we know there's no other light source in this painting? Because that's the only direction where the shadows are going. Yeah, so I mean, that's the main clue to us, right? We, don't, we only see shadows moving in one direction, where, where what would happen if there were other, were other light sources? What would happen to those shadows? So if there were other light sources in the room, what would happen to these shadows? It would either be smaller or you wouldn't really see any. Yeah, depending on the strength of the light source, they would be, I don't know about smaller, possibly, but they would be much lighter, right? They would be filled in, or it's possible, depending on the strength of the light source, we wouldn't see them at all. So again, Vermeer's using light coming from a single direction. And by doing that, Vermeer is making this painting in, in such a way that he is completely in control of the light. So he completely understands what the light's doing. He completely understands how the objects that he's painting are responding to the light. He knows very well what's going to happen um, when light hits certain objects. So, um, okay, so what about this painting? What's, we, we talked about the light and the direction of the light in the previous painting. What about here? Where's, where's the light coming from in this painting? From the left? From the left, again, from the left, right? So it was similar to the Vermeer painting. And um, so we have a figure where there's a strong illumination on one side of the body um, and then the body, as the body wraps around in space, or as the body, as the form, something that we're going to be calling the form of the body, or the volume of the body, as that volume of the body rolls around in space, as it comes closer to us, and arrives at the point on the body that is closest to us, and then as that body rolls back into space away from us, the body, the light on the body changes. 
things, right? Because certain parts of this body are facing the light source and certain parts of the body are turned away from the light source. So this, by the way, is a painting by a 19th century French painter whose last name is spelled I-N-G-R-E-S. Uh, th that name is pronounced Angre, but usually in English people pronounce it Ang, like angle, but without the L at the end. Um, this is, a, this is a, a painting he did as a student. So he was about 20 when he did this. Um, although artists at that time had probably, Ang had probably been studying for about 10 years by the time he did this painting. People, people's education was very different at that time. Um, there's also a, a complexity of what happens to the light and the shadow as the light rolls across the form, right? So we talked about light moving into shadow, but we see more than that, right? So if I, if I, so I, we see more than just the light and the shadow. Looking carefully at this painting, what else do we see in the painting? So we see lights, right? All the lights hitting the form here. And then we see the body rolling around into shadow what else do we see in addition to the light and the shadow? The light and the shadow. I mean, I don't mean like we see a red drapery. We do, but I mean, what what do we see? What what complicates the light and the shadow? Does that make sense? I don't know if that. What about like uh, contrast? Okay, so sure. What do you mean by that? Um. Well, the the light and the dark. It's like. How do I explain it? <laughs> it it adds like depth to it because like the darks are very dark and the lights are very light. So, well, so the light the light and shadow certainly creates a sense of depth, which is exactly how these artists were thinking about the light and the shadow. Um, and I, I think my question actually was a little bit too vague. Um, uh, let me be more specific. So we have, we have light coming into this room from the left. Um, and as I said, the, the, the parts of the body that are facing the light source are illuminated, right? They're receiving light. And the parts of the body that are turned away from the light source are no longer receiving light. Um, so um, I forget who, who spoke last, but you mentioned that there's contrast. So the light situation in this painting is creating a very strong contrast between the lights and the darks, right? There's a, 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 a large difference in what we refer to as the value of the lights as opposed to the value of the darks. So let me just stop there. Um, let's define that term. So I just used the term value. Can anyone define what value means when we use that term talking about paintings or drawings? Um, like the intensity of the color? So value is related to color, but it doesn't actually refer to color. But, I, but my guess is that you're, you're thinking about the right thing. So we're not talking about color. So this is a very light value. It's also a light color. So in that way, it relates to, um, it relates to color, but it's a little bit different. Like this is a very light value. This is a very dark value, which mm -hmm. together they create that contrast we noted. Again, very light value, dark values even darker value, right? So what are, what are we talking about when we say value? Like the gradient? Yeah, I know what you mean. Value simply refers to the degree of lightness or darkness. Um, so of a color, but it doesn't have to be a color, right? So this is a very light value. This is a very dark value. Uh, th this value here is somewhere in between those two. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. But when I say value, what I'm talking about is the degree of lightness or darkness. 
So light values and dark values or middle values. Okay. Um, so again, we have very light values on the parts of the body that are facing the light and we have dark values on the parts of the body that are turned away from the light. Um, what's creating, so we have, if we look at the arm here, we have a, one long area on that arm that is receiving light. So this long shape on the arm is, a, a, is what we would call a plane. In other words, a, 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 something like a broad, flat shape, a broad, flat area that's turned towards the light, right? That's facing the light source. And then as the planes of the arm turn away from the light source, they go into shadow. So we have the light planes and the shadow planes. What's creating this difference here? So there's a difference here in the shadows between this value and this value, right? There's a, a darker value here than there is here. There's also a color difference. Why is this a different color here than here? Because of the light bouncing off of the body? Exactly. So light's bouncing, light's passing the arm, reflecting off the surface of the torso, and then bouncing back into, um, bouncing back into the shadow on the arm. So um, I think that was Kayla who said that. Do you know what that kind of light is called? Uh, is it inverted light or something like that? Say it again. Inverted light. Converted, C-O-N. Uh, inverted. inverted. I, it's, well, um, if it is, uh, that's not a term I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. The only reason I say that is these terms for light and shadow, when artists are talking about it, um, can be flexible. It's typically called reflected light. Uh, it just because that's what it is. It's light that is reflecting off of a surface and then bouncing back into the shadow. So what anyone, can anyone guess why this color is different than this color? Can, can people see that on the screen? I don't, I don't know how, how well the quality, um, what the qualities you're seeing. Can you see the color difference between this area of the shadow and this area? I think it's because that part is closer to his body. It's so. closer to his body, so it's lighter, okay. right? Because it's getting more reflected light. The, as the arm moves further away from the reflective surface, it gets less reflected light. But here where it's close, it's getting a considerable amount of reflected light. But why is it a different color? It's a, this area on the arm is slightly more orange than this area, right? So why isn't it just a sort of lighter version of that? Why is it lighter and also more orange? So they pop against each other? Like, since they're contrasting colors, they pop against each other? What are the what are the contrasting colors? These two uh, here? Yeah. Not quite. Um, not really in this case. I mean, contrasting colors do pop against each other. And, and it's true in a sense in that this is really a kind of gray brown. Um, but when we see it next to that orange, it almost looks a little bit green. So, um, you know, at least I see it that way. Um, and that's that's the result of that kind of contrast that you're talking about. This is actually, anyone else want to make a guess why this is more orange? Would it be because of the way the arm is turned? Because of the way the arm is turned? What do you mean by that? Well, I feel like the bottom part is more like twisted inward, so it would be a little darker, but I don't know. Um, give me one second. I have to get my earphones again. Sorry. Hello. 
having trouble hearing. Sorry, I don't like wearing headphones, but. Um, okay, so can you say that again? Yeah, so I was just saying, I feel like the way the arm is placed, usually the bottom part of the arm is twisted more inward to you. So maybe that's why it's darker. Well, it's definitely, that's definitely true. This, the arm is turned in such a way that it's twisted um, in a slightly different direction. But that's not quite what's happening here. So what's happening here is the light, again, is passing by the arm. It's reflecting off the uh, surface of the torso. And then when light does that, what light does is it picks up the color of the surface it's reflecting off of. So it, it, we, we usually call that inheriting the, the color. So the light rays will pick up some of this color and then take that color with them. And as that light travels back into the shadow area, some of the color, some of the warm color of the flesh is brought back into the shadow area. And light that reflects off skin, because skin is translucent, it not only picks up, uh, in this case, the kind of light yellowish color of the skin, uh, it also actually picks up some of the color below the surface of the skin. So color from blood vessels and that kind of thing. And inherits that color and brings it back into the shadow side. So that's getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. I'm um, talking about that element of light and shadow and color. Uh, but that's something we're gonna be dealing with throughout the semester what causes us to see color as we do. It's not nearly as straightforward as we often think it is. Um, so there's also a complexity of, or as the light crosses over the form, there's a complex sequence of um, light events that we can see on all of these forms. So we've talked about the light and the dark side of the form, and we've talked about the reflected light, right? light that bounces off of the surface and then bounces back into the shadow side of the form. And we can see subtle reflected light in here. So we wouldn't be able to see any detail in the shadow side if there weren't some light reflecting into it. So notice here on the arm, we have light, dark, reflected light. And then we have this long band of slightly darker shadow along the shadow edge. We also have it here. It's more subtle, but it's there. There's a long band of slightly darker shadow along the shadow edge. And that long band of shadow or that darker shadow is created by the reflected light. So the light's illuminating planes that are facing the reflective surface, but are turned to, but those reflective light rays are not hitting this plane, which is neither facing the light side um, or the reflective surfaces. It's not, it's not facing the plane of light, nor is it facing the planes that are reflecting light back into the shadows. Um, I'm not going to talk in depth about light on this image. I'll, I'll talk about that in, in further images. So one thing to, um, let me go back to this. So light's incredibly important in this class. In order to make the kinds of paintings we're going to be striving to make, we have to think very carefully about light and how light is affecting the objects we're looking at. We don't usually in our day-to-day -day lives think about light this way anymore. So in, in these images, this Vermeer painting, um, this Ang painting, and when these artists made these paintings, people thought about light or people experienced light this way all the time simply because there was an absence of artificial light, right? So light was experienced either in the world outside where there's a single light source, of course, the sun, or light was experienced inside, but almost always in a room where there was a single source of light. Just because at that time it was incredibly expensive to build homes 
with windows in them. And so homes, if they had windows, would have one or two, um, and usually on one side of the room. So light was constantly experienced at this time as a, as a single source, right? So the world uh, defined by lights and shadows was the common experience, um, was the ubiquitous experience. We don't experience that anymore in general. So if we, most, for, most, for the most part, when we walk into a room, even in the middle of the day, we turn the lights on. So we experience the world with multiple light sources, light that may be coming in through windows, light that's probably coming from a center, a lamp in the center of the ceiling. There may be other light sources around. There may be light streaming in from another room. Usually in art classes at Queens College, for example, people walk into those rooms and for anyone who has taken classes at the studios at Clapper Hall, you'll know that, or you'll pro you probably experience people flicking on all those fluorescents, right? So there are those four or five banks of big, I think horrible fluorescent lights on the ceiling. And that light just gets everywhere, right? That light floods the room. Um, and so we, we, we experience everything as kind of generally illuminated. And we, ri we rarely experience this kind of illumination where we're just looking at light and shadow or very conscious of lights and shadows. Of course, we experience it in the outside world, particularly on, on sunny days, not so much on a day like today, although you, you do see it out there, it's just more subtle. Um, we don't typically, but we don't typically experience this. And we, and we don't, because it's not, a prominent part of our consciousness, we don't notice it. But in this class, we're going to be looking very carefully at light and shadow and how light and shadow really in, effects, it in effect allows us to see. It, it, it's the thing that makes it possible for us to see. And for our purposes, it's gonna be the thing that makes it possible to make the kind of paintings we want to make. So, as I mentioned last week, our objective in this class is going to be making representational paintings, right? So paintings of objects in the world. And we're going to be, and, in, and making a representational painting means we're taking a flat surface and we're trying to convince the viewer that they're not looking at a flat surface, right? So this, as we know, if we were to see this at the museum it's located at, what we, what we would be looking at is a flat surface, just a, a piece of canvas stretched across a wooden frame with a layer of white paint and then subsequent layers of paint on it, right? So it's just nothing but a flat surface. But we look at this and we believe that it's not a flat surface that it's actually the three-dimensional world opening up before us. And in order to make a convincing image in that way, in order to make a flat surface appear to be the three-dimensional world opening up in front of us, an artist has to be very conscious of light and how light uh, moves across volumes so volume just meaning anything that occupies space. So this sphere is a volume. How light moves across volumes in a space. So this is a very simple representation of what happens with light on volumes. Okay, so we have the light in this case coming from the right hand side. So this sphere is illuminated um, in, in this case, right down the middle. So we have a light side and we have a shadow side. And we're gonna be talking about that a lot, light side and shadow side. And we're gonna be spending a lot of time really studying um, lights and darks and value relationships. So light side, shadow side. Um, but then we have a complexity of incidents of light as this volume rolls around in space, comes toward us, 
and then turns away from us. So what do we have? So these are terms having to do with light and shadow that are going to be important in our class. And I don't test you in order to remember these terms or anything like that, but they are terms that as people should try to remember them as we are using them, you know, only so that we have a common language. So we know what we're talking about when we're discussing the paintings we make in this class. So let's look at the light and shadow. This is sometimes called light logic. So let's look at what happens to light and shadow as it, as it rolls around a form. So we have the light mass. So there's a light mass here. And this part of the form is illuminated because the planes on this form, because these planes on the form are turned towards the light. So they're either directly facing the light or they are facing the light at an oblique angle. So we have the light mass, and then we have the shadow mass. And everything in the shadow mass are, is a plane on the form that's turned away from the light source. Um, and I just wanna remind people, if I use a term, to, especially today, but any time in the class that I haven't defined, um, please let, don't hesitate to let me know. So in the painting by Ang, we talked about, um, we talked about the light and the dark, the light mass and the dark mass, and we talked about the reflected light. So whoever made this image has indicated the reflected light here. There's actually reflected light all the way down this form. Um, it's, it has a slightly different character here than it does here. Um, so there's the reflected light, right? So light is passing by the form, bouncing off surfaces around the object and then um, reflecting back into the shadow side of the form. So something I think is useful to think about when we're talking about lights and shadows is the only, the only reason we see anything at all is because of light, right? Light reflects off of objects and then that light beam that has reflected it off an object travels in a straight line to our eye and our brain registers that object only because light has hit that object and then traveled from that object back to our eye. So if we see anything at all, there has to be light on the object. So these planes on the form are turned away from the light source. If we, if there were no light hitting, let me back up a second. So that implies, if these planes are turned away from the light source, that implies that there's no light getting to these planes. But if that were the case, if no light at all was, was hitting um, these, this side of the form, then that would read to us as pure black. We would see nothing. We, we simply wouldn't be able to see anything here because no light would be reflecting off the object and coming back to our eye. But we never see the world like that, except in extremely um, controlled situations. So what's happening, again, to get back to reflected light, is light isn't hitting this side of the form directly, but light's bouncing off actually a, a wide range of surfaces in this room, and then bouncing back into the shadow side. So there's some illumination here. It's not nearly as strong as the light side of the form. And the light is primarily bouncing off the surfaces or the light that's, that's reaching the shadow side is primarily bouncing off surfaces right around the object. So we're getting light bouncing off surfaces and reflecting back into the object. So that creates the reflected light, which is something I'm going to be asking people to look for and find in the objects you paint. And then it's, it's creating something we talked about in the painting by Ang. It's also creating this core of the shadow. So does everyone see this core of the shadow, the slightly darker, and in this case, slightly grayer, slightly bluer, grayer um, band of shadow that runs down this edge? Do people see that? Um, yeah. Okay, so we have light side, dark side, reflected light, core of the shadow. And um, this person has indicated halftone 
So these are called half tones or mid tones. So these are half tones or mid tones are parts of the light that are turned away from the light source at an oblique angle. So they're not getting full light, but they're getting some light. So these are half tones. And there's a, a half tone right along the edge of the shadow that gives a softness to that shadow edge. It, it turns that edge from, um, it creates a kind of soft transition from the shadow into the light. Um, so this, often the division between light and shadow, that line where the light ends and the shadow begins is called the terminator. That's a, it's a little bit of a funny term for me. That's a, a term that's only come into use in the past 10 or 15 years. When I first learned about light, we just called this the shadow edge, which to me is much more descriptive. Terminator I, apparently is a uh, word that was borrowed from um, the way the moon is described and the division between light and the shadow on the moon is called the lunar terminator. So that, that term seems to have come from that um, usage. So terminator or shadow edge, um, this is called the cast shadow. So anytime there's light and shadow on an object, there's going to be a cast shadow because an object is gonna block light from hitting another surface. The very darkest part of the shadows are called the occlusion shadows, or again, that's a relatively recent term in my experience. I used to just call them the shadow accents either occlusion shadow or shadow accent. And then I don't think you can see it so clearly here, but um, there's also a highlight. And people are probably very familiar with the highlight. Um, a highlight is the point on the form where the light, the, the angle that the light hits the form is equal to the angle that the light is reflecting off the form and, and moving back towards your eye. So the angle, the angle of the relationship between the direction of the light and the form it's hitting, would any, whichever point on this form has an e equal angle between the direction of the light and then the light reflecting towards your eye is where the highlight is. So we're gonna be talking about all of these elements of light and shadow extensively. And in today's painting, we're gonna be concentrating um, on, we're primarily gonna be concentrating on finding those elements of light and shadow. So this is a uh, figure drawing, a 19th century figure drawing. Um, and if you look at, you know, thinking about what we just talked about in terms of light and shadow, if you look at most paintings or drawings that are um, in one way representation, one way or another representational, now it's certainly not true of all, but most paintings or drawings that are representational and virtually all that we would call traditional representation, you'll see very clearly all of those elements of light and shadow. So this is a 19th century figure drawing by an artist named Pierre Paul Proudhon. And um, you'll notice here on this, on this figure, um, if we compare it to this painting a student did of a sphere, uh, we have the exact same situation, just in a much more complicated uh, or expressed in a much more complicated way. So we have this long, complicated light shape. It's similar to just a more complicated version of the light mass on the sphere. So again, this long complicated light mass. There is a light mass on the, on the leg on the left. There's a little light mass where the figure's wrist is emerging from behind the cast shadow of the body. We have this long irregular shadow mass, right? So all of this is shadow. And it's a complicated version of the shadow mass. We have the figure casting a shadow on the floor and the wall, just like the cast shadow here. Uh, we have the reflected light in this painting and the core of the shadow. And similarly, we have this long, complicated reflected light in the figure. 
and this long, snaky, complicated core of the shadow. We have half tones where the shadow rolls into the light. And then we have half tones describing the small nuances of the form, uh, just like the half tone here. And then it's not terribly visible, but we can see the highlight on the form. And then we get the highlight here. So light mass, highlight, half tones, the dark mass, core of the shadow, reflected light, cast shadow, shadow accent or occlusion shadow. So we're going to be spending the entire semester really studying those elements of light and shadow on forms. So if, if we somewhat randomly choose images from throughout the history of painting, and I, I sort of randomly chose these images, um, we can, we'll see in these images that exact same kind of consciousness about how light and shadow should be used in a painting. So this is a still life from around 1600 by a, a painter named Francisco de Zerberon. Um, lights coming from the left. There's a light mass and a dark mass on the objects, core of the shadow, reflected light, half tones, highlights, same thing on this um, cup. Everything in the painting has those basic elements of light and shadow. This is a Giovanni Bellini um, risen Christ from probably late 1400s. Same situation, light coming from the left, light mass, dark mass, core of the shadow, reflected light. So over and over again, artists from throughout history are thinking about and using light in, that, in this manner. So this is a 20th century painting uh, by an artist named Gabriel Munter. This is a self-portrait. Light mass, dark mass, um, a somewhat subtle core of the shadow, reflected light. Um, Gabriel Munter has primarily left out the half tone, except here on the nose you see it, here on the forehead you see it. So Gabriel Munter is a painter who would be described as an expressionist. Um, not exactly, not usually, thought about as a traditional painter, although there are very traditional aspects of this painting. This is a contemporary artist, a painter named Lycia Scavage, um, who does these kind of eccentric, you know, I, I would say slightly perverse paintings of um, these kind of imagined female figures. Uh, but she's very conscious of a traditional use of light and shadow. And in Lycia Scavage's paintings, there's an intentional, I think, an intentional tension between these, the kind of perverse nature, I don't mean perverse in a sexual way, I mean perverse, a kind of like idiosyncratic sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? There's a grotesque element, like a deliberately grotesque element to Alicia Scavage's paintings. And here she's using, I, th I think she's intentionally contrasting that perversity or that grotesque element um, with what we usually associate traditional light with, which are these kind of caressing, gentle images. So she's setting up that deliberate contrast. Uh, but nevertheless very consciously using light and shadow in exactly the way we're, we've been talking about it. This is another contemporary painting by Kerry James Marshall. Uh, and the, the painting is, um, you know, we don't, we perhaps don't immediately see this as a painting about observed light and shadow because Kerry James Marshall is an artist who's so conscious of um, color relationships and color used in a kind of pattern way. Um, he's very interested in a symbolic representation of figures. Um, nevertheless, if we really look at all the figures, the figures are illuminated uh, in this case by these overhead lights. So we have light mass, dark mass, light mass, dark mass on all the figures and you 
we can't see it so clearly in this image, but if you go close up on these uh, figures and faces, you see it on, these, on the faces as well. So throughout history, artists have thought about light in the way we are going to be studying it. So whether we're talking about artists from the Renaissance to artists today, um, have used light in, in the way we're going to be studying it. And I think knowing the way light functions, um, f both in the history of painting and how you can make light work in your painting is a very, is an important thing to know. So it's something that's, that we're going to be um, studying carefully. So you can see it a little bit in this detail where we see the light the reflected light, the, the lights on the top planes of the forms. We can see a slightly lighter masses on the illuminated parts of the arm. Um, so Kerry James Marshall has carried it throughout the painting. So, okay. So um, I'm gonna end the slides there. So the painting we're gonna be doing today is a painting where we are going to be taking a very simple object and we're going to be illuminating that object with a single light source and painting the object so that we really study those basic elements of light and shadow that we've been talking about. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to talking a little bit about setting up for the painting, um, how to set up your materials, what materials we're gonna use, I'm gonna show you my painting table, I'm gonna show you my setup, um, and then I'm gonna move on to doing the demo. So. Okay, I'm, um, I, I can't wear my headphones while I do this. If I'm not loud enough for anybody, please let me know. And I, part of the technical difficulties today was figuring out, um, let me close my window as long as it's possible, uh, trying to figure out how to make this uh, camera work. This is not an ideal camera because the canvas I'm working on is not bent. Uh, so I'm gonna have to get some kind of better camera, but this will do for today. Okay, so let me first, I'm gonna turn it over here. So this is my, um, this is my painting table. You know, I, have a, I obviously have a different relationship to painting than most of you do. So I'm not expecting people to have this kind of setup. Um, this is, uh, I have a glass palette. So this, this palette here, take all this stuff off. That's, my, that's the surface I mix my paint on. Um, I, think, I, I think probably most people bought the disposable palettes. So every day I have to clean that off. Um, if you have those disposable pallets, you can just rip off that sheet and throw it away. Um, so, um, but if anyone does have, if anyone did find an alternative, in other words, a, a different kind of surface to mix on, let me just ask, did anybody, did everyone buy the um, disposable pallets or is anybody using something different? Um, I have an older, like, wooden pallet. You have a wooden pallet, okay, that's fine. So, and you have, do you have experience using it? Yes. Okay. okay. So I asked everybody to get um, three jars, three containers. So something like this. So these would, any of these kinds of things would work perfectly well. Um, if you, you, know, you, you could use old food containers. Um, you know, if you, if you bought them, that's fine too. Um, so the reason I, I want people to have three containers is um, in order to use your mineral spirits in a way that is most useful and I think helps you save money most easily. 
So you're going to use one of these containers to put your mineral spheres in. So let, let's just say you use this. Um, so um, I'm going to use this. Instead. So let's just say you use this one. So when you're setting up um, your workstation, you'll pour out some mineral spirits. You know, you want, don't be stingy on your mineral spirits. You want to use, you know, maybe that's a little bit too much, but you want to use something like that. So that's what you're going to clean your brushes with. Okay. So I have, um, I have, this old jar that I've been using for years um, with my mineral spirits in it. And I painted yesterday. Um, I, I stopped painting late last night and I put the lid back on this. And overnight, what, what has happened, and this, this happens with mineral spirits. So let's just say that's your. So here's your clean mineral spirits, and you spend all day uh, cleaning your brush with mineral spirits. So your mineral spirits get progressively dirty. So um, by the end of the day, that's going to be dirty and sludgy, right? And so at the end of yesterday, when I finished painting, the mineral spirits in here were dirty and sludgy. So like, you know, they start to become a little bit muddy the more paint you clean off of that. But you don't want to throw that paint, you don't want to throw that mineral spirits away. So what happens with mineral spirits is you leave it overnight or you leave it, you know, depending on when you come back to paint, maybe the next day uh, or the next week, whatever. Um, and what's, what's going to have happened is all of that paint that you've cleaned off in the mineral spirits, all of those particles of paint are going to have settled to the bottom and created a kind of muddy sludge at the bottom of your mineral spirits. And your mineral spirits, so most of the mineral spirits in, in here will be clear. So th these mineral spirits yesterday were all dirty and sludgy, but the sludge has settled to the bottom. And so I'm going to take my second jar, so jar number two, of the three I asked you to get. And I'm going to pour out the clean mineral spirits into that jar. So the reason you want to do that is, so this, the, the mineral spirits are a little bit stained, but that's, that's totally usable mineral spirits. And then um, there's a little bit of mineral spirits left in here, and there's a little bit of sludge. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to mix up that little bit of remainder. And I'm going to dump all of that into this sludge jar. And I'll, I will, I'll let that sludge build up until this jar is filled, and then I'll just throw that away. And so you're allowed to do that in New York City. In a lot of cities, you have to bring that to hazardous ways. But in New York City, you can just dump that in the trash. Um, so I now have my empty mineral spirits jar, and I have my, my transfer jar of clean mineral spirits. So I'm just going to pour that back into my mineral spirits jar, and I'm going to use that clean mineral spirits. So that's perfectly good mineral spirits. You don't need to throw that away and waste that money. You can keep using that mineral spirits over and over again. So this gallon of mineral spirits will last me like a year. I'll um, top that off a little bit. So I'm going to have this for the next year. So um, don't waste money by tossing your mineral spirits. I mean, for one thing, you can't throw mineral spirits away down the sink. Of course, you're not going to get caught, but you're not supposed to do that. Um, it's bad for the water supply. It's environmentally bad. 
Um, and you don't need to do that. You can keep using that mineral spirits. Uh, one thing about disposal of mineral spirits, if for whatever reason you have to, the way you're supposed to get rid of mineral spirits is with your regular garbage. So you're supposed to, according to the Department of Sanitation, uh, pour your mineral spirits into something that is absorbent. So like um, rags or newspapers, or the best thing is kitty litter, if you want to go that far, um, and then just throw it out in the regular trash. But you don't, I really want to emphasize, especially people working at home, you don't want to throw mineral spirits down the sink. It should always be disposed of in the trash. So whether we're talking about this sludge or um, if for whatever reason you have to throw away mineral spirits, but you shouldn't have to. So really try to have those three containers. One container for your mineral spirits that you use to clean your brushes, um, a transfer jar, and then a sludge jar where you can dump the sludge. You know, put that away in a, if you have a box, put it in a closet. Just keep it somewhere out of the way during the class. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Can I explain that a little further? No, that was perfect. So if anybody, I'm sorry, did someone want me to explain that further? So if anyone needs me to clarify at any point, just let me know. So tomorrow, so I cleaned off black paint in here. Tomorrow, all that black paint is going to be at the bottom, and um, this will be clear mineral spirits. Okay, so I have um, I have my palette. I have my palette knife. My old palette knife. Um, I have. I like these. Um, industrial paper towels, but regular paper towels are totally fine. So I like to have paper towels, um, toilet paper, um, and then uh, cloth uh, fabric rags, so old t-shirts. And I, I highly recommend um, having these. So this is a, a, a rag I've used for a few weeks. Um, so the, all, all, those are very, those are extremely useful um, in cleaning up and the, pro, and the process of cleaning your brushes and so on as you're painting. So, you know, that's part of this t-shirt that I'm progressively cutting. So again, to get rags, like old t-shirts are great, um, but you can also, again, get a bag of rags at a hardware store. So um, you want to try to have all these things. You get paper towels. I like having toilet paper you know, to do things like when I use my palette knife um, just to clean, I just take a little piece of toilet paper and wipe it off instead of making the ray get progressively dirtier. Um, I have a, I have a paper, a paper bag or a plastic bag. I pin it to the side to my table where I throw all my painting trash. Um, so painting trash, I would recommend if you can throw that away, have, have a container for your painting trash and throw it away at the end of your painting session outside. So if it's possible to throw it away in a um, outside garbage bin, that's best. I mean, there's, it's, it's extremely unlikely that this would be any kind of a fire hazard because this, because odorless mineral spirits and especially Gansol are not very flammable. Again, they're much less flammable than, for example, nail polish removal. Uh, but I think it's a good idea to try to dispose of that in an outside container and if you have to throw it away in an inside container, um, I would just take the bag at the end of your painting session and saturate the rags and paper towels in there with water and then throw it away. And it's perfectly safe. Um, okay, so I 
again, you, you have your container of mineral spirits. You want to have a generous amount of mineral spirits, paper towels, rags. Um, hopefully people have their brushes. And okay. And then we have, um, today we're going to be using just black and white. So the first painting we do is going to be just using white and black. So, um, so the next thing, so then we have, um, so this is my setup, okay? So this is the setup I'm gonna be working from. So um, the, because of this camera, that light gets blasted out, but I've, I've set up this, my, the, the simple cone in a box. And the reason I strongly recommend people get a box to set up these still lives is you want to have a situation where you can really just have a single light source. So I have my clip on lamp illuminating the simple floor on the left hand side. And then the box is blocking out any light that may be coming from other parts of the room. Okay? Just the best way to do this kind of still light, especially when you're working at in a home situation. And I sent, I hope. I sent everybody a decent image of that cone. I sent everybody a photograph of that cone that hopefully you can refer to as I'm doing the painting. Because I'm not gonna be able to have my camera on both the painting I'm doing and the, um, and the still life, okay? So refer to that image. That, that, the image that I sent you today of just the cone is a photograph of the cone that I'm working from here. Okay. Um, Professor, I just, I have a silly question. Yep. Um, are we gonna be having breaks during this class? Yeah, we have a break in the middle of class. Okay. Yeah. All uh, right. Thank you. So uh, this camera is not the best, but it'll do for today. All right, so I showed everybody my, um, my palette that I typically use. When I do these demos, I, um, when I do the demos, I like to use this palette, upright palette, so you can see what I'm mixing as I'm mixing. So um, we're going to be using black light. Black. And um, we're going to be doing a painting of this very simple object. So in this class, we start the semester with very simple objects, very simple geometric forms that very clearly reveal those basic elements of painting that we're studying. And then we move from there to more complex objects and more complex elements in the painting. So we start adding color, we start adding texture, and we make, we slowly work towards more complex um, more, co more complex paintings. Okay, so, okay. So, um, so I'm going to draw, um, I'm going to draw the painting with a brush about that size start the drawing. People, I notice that people often want to start a drawing with a brush something like this size. They want to find a brush that they think approximates um, a, a pencil. But don't, don't do that. Don't, don't use a small 
pointed brush to do your drawing. It's not, um, it's not advantageous when making a painting. I'll show you why. Um, it's much better to use um, the type of brush that I asked you to get, um, I, either a filbert or a flat. Um, it's much better to use one of these brushes. Um, and you can use it as a kind of chisel um, to do your drawing. So I'll show you what I mean. So, So the first thing, um, and again, hopefully people can refer to their, um, to the photo I sent today. So the first thing we need to do, obviously, is draw our spill, right? Uh, we could just start painting um, without drawing, but I, I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to do something. So I want to talk a little bit about drawing. So often in painting classes, um, not everybody has had drawing as a prerequisite. Ideally, I would like to have everybody have taken drawing, but that's not always the case. So I'm going to start the painting today uh, by talking about some basic fundamental drawing issues. Um, so I'm, I'm doing this painting on a board very similar to the ones you bought. Okay. I'm going to take my black paint and um, I'm going to draw that cube, I mean that, sweet, that cone. I'm going to draw the cone and the space it's sitting in. But I'm not going to draw that cone uh, just by sort of arbitrarily eyeballing the contour. So I'm not going to do something like this. I'm instead going to look for what's often referred to as um, the underlying structure of what I'm drawing. So what that is, is you're looking for certain underlying elements or a kind of architectural structure that will help you draw that object, whatever it may be, in this case it's a relatively simple object, as accurately as possible. So in the case of this cone, the first thing I'm going to look for is a center line. And the reason I'm going to find that is because a cone in order to draw that cone convincingly, um, I'm going to want that cone to be, to appear to be absolutely vertical. Right? That's, a, that's a principle of a cone. Right? A cone um, is a vertical form. Right? It's not leaning to one side or the other. So in order to help me establish that very easily, I'm going to draw a center. And then um, if, I, if I talk about the ellipse, on the cone. Does anyone know what I'm referring to? What, what, what is the ellipse on the cone? Can anyone define what an ellipse is? It's like the way that the circular part is um, seen by the viewer. I'm sorry, say it again. It's the circular part of the cone. Right. It's the, yeah. an ellipse in drawing or painting is a circle seen in perspective. So it's a circle seen at an oblique angle to the viewer's plane of vision. So this is the cone I'm working from. Um, we know that if we were to look, look at the bottom of the cone, the bottom of the cone would be a circle shape. An ellipse is a circle that the viewer sees turned away from the plane of vision. So as we turn that circle, that circle shape, at, at, at a more and more oblique angle away from the viewer's plane of vision, that, that uh, circle becomes more and more distorted. We no longer see it as a circle. Instead, instead, we see it as what we refer to as an ellipse. So after setting up the um, simple, uh, the simple center line for the cone, 
I'm going to establish uh, where my ellipse is going to be. And in, in perspective drawing, um, an ellipse is always drawn on a horizontal. So in order to make, to draw this cone so that I have an accurate sense of its verticality and an accurate sense of the an accurate uh, shape for that ellipse, I'm going to um, do a center line and then a horizontal. And that horizontal is going to help me place that ellipse. I'm going to start the drawing of the cone by drawing that ellipse. So I'm looking really carefully at, uh, at that circle that is turned away from me. And I'm asking myself how how wide it is compared to how, how wide it is compared to how high it is. How open is that circle? Like how 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 much is it distorted away from the shape of the circle? So uh, I think I'm seeing an ellipse that has a curve, something like that. And um, before I go any further, I know that one side of a cone is going to be uh, bilaterally symmetrical with the other side. In other words, one side of the cone is going to be exactly the same shape and mirror image as the other side. So I'm going to make sure one half of the cone is equal in width to the other half. And then I'm just going to determine the height of the cone. Make those lines connecting. And so I can start that cone with a fairly accurate um, drawing. Now, a cone, the, the the horizontal axis of an ellipse, again, should always be absolutely horizontal. So the axis of an ellipse, the long axis, the long axis of an ellipse, will never tilt one way or the other um, in our plane of vision. Okay. So this, this long axis of the ellipse should be absolutely horizontal. So I'm going to check that. It's pretty much horizontal. You know, by drawing a little. So I have a decent, I think, a decent start for my cone. You always want to look for that, uh, for what that underlying, that helpful underlying structure is um, in whatever you're drawing. We'll talk about that um, more extensively the more we draw or the, the more complex our objects get. Okay, so the next thing, so I'm drawing, I'm not just drawing a cone in a, an empty space. It's a, it's a cone that's sitting on the bottom plane of a box and I can see the back plane of the box behind it. And we can call that the block, the back wall. So I, I want to draw the division between the plane of the surface that the cone is resting on and the wall behind it. So where does that division between surface and wall, how does that relate to the cone? So I'm going to look at whether that division happens halfway up. Does it happen higher than halfway? Does it happen lower than halfway? It happens just a little bit lower than halfway. So the division between The division between the surface that the cone is resting on and the wall intersects with the cone just a little bit below halfway. Let me draw that. Okay. 
again, I'm very carefully looking at, I'm trying to get proportions accurate, I'm trying to get the relationship between objects accurate. So now in this very simple setup, I have a very simple drawing of the objects I'm going to So, um, okay, so I see, I, I have my contour drawing of the cone. I still have those underlying structure lines underneath. Those don't matter, they can stay. I have um, a, 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 a simple block in of the space that cone is in. So I have the division between the surface that the cone is resting on and the wall. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to look carefully at the light and shadow. So what exactly is happening um, with the light and shadow? So I, I want to, to find where on this form the light, tra the, the light transitions from the light mass into the shadow mass. And I'm going to draw out that transition. So that's going to be part of my drawing. So taking my paint. And I, I'm, I'm thinning the paint a little bit with some mineral spirits. Make it a little bit more liquidy. You can certainly do that. So, the, if you look at the image I sent, the, the photograph of what I'm working from, I think you'll see that there's a division between light and shadow that's about one quarter of the way over. So, the cone divides from light to shadow just about here. Let me get rid of the best I can. I'll clean up the drawing a little. Professor? Yeah? Um, you're cleaning it with the mineral spirits? I'm thinning it with mineral spirits, yeah. Okay. And, and, and cleaning it up with, with mineral spirits, with a rag dipped in mineral spirits, that's right. Okay, thank you. And so, um, okay, so I have my cone and then the division of light and shadow right around here. It's about the, the right-hand quarter of the cone um, is falls into shadow, right? So all of this side of the cone is in shadow. And uh, that's happening because our light is coming from, as people know from the setup, The light is coming from approximately this direction. The light's coming from the left, like that, um, and hitting the left hand side of the cone. And then as that cone rolls away from the light source, it moves in the shadow. Now there's not only the shadow mass on the right hand side of the, the cone, we often refer to that as form shadow. So the shadow the shadow that's on the form itself. So I want, also want to draw in the cast shadow. So the cast shadow always starts at the same point that the shadow starts on the form. So the cast shadow starts at that same point and then moves backward along the surface of the table like this. So we 
have a cash shadow here. Something like that. So we've got our cone and we've indicated the light mass and the dark mass and the cash shadow. So um, now before I go any further, I want, to, I want to introduce a measuring technique that's going to help me figure out if the, if the proportions on my cone are accurate. So when I say the proportions on my cone, what do I mean by that? If I'm trying to find accurate proportions, what, what do I mean? Does anyone know what that when we're talking about drawing objects, what, what does proportion refer to? You don't want it to be narrower or wider than what you see in real life. You want the measurements to be fairly accurate. Right. So this is, of course, that's not necessarily true in all paintings, right? There are many artists who are not that interested in that. But if, if we're using this as an opportunity to train ourselves to be able to see accurate, you know, to to be able to accurately represent what we're looking at, we want to try to get accurate proportions. So I want to make my cone, um, I want to make the height of my cone accurate to the width. And I don't want my, I don't want the drawing of my cone to be long and skinny if my cone that I'm looking at is relatively squat and wide, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my brush uh, and I'm going to take the width of the cone. So I'm going to be actually doing it up on my still life. So I'm going to be doing this. I'm going to be holding my brush up in front of the cone. And I'm going to be taking that width like this. And then I'm going to turn that width and see how many times that width fits into the height. So it fits in once. So the cone is about one and a half times the width, okay? So I'm gonna do the same thing to the cone I'm thinking here. So, so one, so I'm gonna see if my cone is accurate. So one, one. My cone could be a little bit Sure. So I'm going to take off just a little bit of height on my cone. Well, and of course, uh, this painting isn't going to be any better or any worse if the proportion of the cone is a little bit off. But I think it's it's well worth training your, yourself to be able to see accurate proportions um, because then you can manipulate those proportions all you want. But you're not manipulating the proportions by mistake. You're manipulating proportions when you do it uh, intentionally. And, and you know, the, the, some people find it much harder to draw or paint in a way where you achieve a kind of absolute accuracy of proportions. And that's fine. That doesn't mean you're not going to be a terrific artist. But I think it's well worth trying to develop the ability to see proportions as accurately as possible. So now we have a good working line um, to get started. This line here is a little bit uh, arced but I'm gonna change that when I block in the, the values around it. I'm not going to, um, I'm not gonna do that in the drawing right now. Okay, so what I'm gonna be doing is, I have a very subtly colored still life, right? I have a, a pale yellow cone, I have a, a gray background, I have a brown surface that the cone is resting on. Um, but we don't have colors today, right? We have black and white. So I'm just going to be looking for one accurate proportion as we, as we just did. 
I'm going to be looking for the elements of light and shadow. And I'm going to be looking for accurate value relationships. So that's incredibly important. In a way, I'm, going to, I'm not going to be painting a cone today. I'm instead going to think about this as painting value relationships. So painting values of lighter areas of color as opposed to areas of darker color or darker value, excuse me. Um, it's a, a way of thinking about the paintings we make that I think is really so I'm going to start this painting as I always start my paintings by blocking in the background first. Um, and the reason I do that is, um, and, I, and I want people to, to do that in your paintings. Um, and when, we're, when this class meets in person, I insist on it. I obviously can't insist on it in this um, situation. But I, I like people to try to do this. Um, and I'll talk about why in a minute. So I'm going to block in the, the background before I start working on the color. So I have here a value scale. This is a kind of conventional value scale. It's a strip of values that go from white to black. And there are seven divisions of value in between. So as I look at my still life, I'm going to be asking myself, what is the value of those different areas of the still life I'm looking at? So what I mean by that is, let's say I'm looking at the background in that still life. So again, if you refer to that photograph I sent to you. And I'm going to be asking myself, what is the value of that? Is that a very dark gray? Is it a very light gray? Is it a middle gray? Is it approximately this value, this value? Um, and I'm going to be making my decision about what value I'm going to accept based on that. So looking at that background, uh, I see a kind of a middle gray, but a, a middle gray that's sort of on the, slightly on the light side of the middle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a relatively big brush, and I'm going to mix up a value that I think is about the right value for that value. I'm going to try that value. As I mix it on the palette, that looks like it's about the right value. And I'm just going to block in. I'm not going to get fussy about this. Um, I'm just going to block in very, very broadly one big tone for that background. So what I mean by that, I'm not going to be looking at any details or any small differences. You know, if there's a wrinkle on that piece of paper on the background wall or anything like that. I'm just going to be looking for the very big simplified value of that background. And I think it's a value something like this. Now, as, as, as I'm putting this value down, people may be looking at that value and thinking to yourself, that looks awfully dark. Does anybody, anybody think that looks maybe too dark for the value in the background? Again, if you're able, hopefully you're able to refer to that photo I sent you. So sometimes when you when you put down the initial value mass, it, it's going to look darker. Um, that it actually is. And that's because, anyone know why? Like this looks darker now than it will ultimately look when I get the whole painting blocked in. Anybody know why that is? It'll be in comparison to the more like extreme light on the cone. Well, it looks dark now because it's in comparison to all the white around it. 
But when all of these areas have other values, this is not going to appear quite as dark. But you're right, it will appear dark compared to the extreme light here. Um, so I, I'm putting down um, very, very large masses of value. So this is a kind of rule, not a rule, that's the wrong word. Uh, I think a good bit of advice um, is to always work from the very large masses, the very large, simple masses, and progressively get down to the smaller nuances, right? The smaller details. You don't want to try to chain up a whole bunch of little incidents and create the large mass. You want to go from the large masses to the smaller. So again, just meaning that I'm just blocking in a big, simple tone to that background. So now I'm going to block in. I may need to make that a little bit lighter, but we'll see. Um, now I'm going to block in a value for the surface that the cone is sitting on. So what's the value difference between the background and between the back wall and the surface that the cone is sitting on? What's a lighter and what's a darker value? Like is, is the surface of the table darker or lighter than the cone? Looking at the image I sent people. It's lighter. The surface of the table, is it darker or lighter than the background? Um, darker. It's darker. darker right? So it's, it's actually considerably darker. Right, so I'm going to mix, again, using, mixing up a large mass of a, a gray. I'm going to mix up a darker value. And I'm going to plot that in. Looks like the same value. It's darker. So. so as I'm blocking, um, I don't want. I want to move when I put the paint down. I want to move the brush in an active way. I don't want to imitate the painting of a house. I don't want to just do this. The reason I don't want to do that is I don't want to be putting the paint down in a way that reinforces the flatness of that surface. So we're, remember, we're trying to make a painting where we convince the viewer that this flat surface is not a flat surface at all. We want to convince the viewer that this flat surface is actually a space that opens up beyond the plane of the painting. So part of the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to put the paint down in an active way. So I'm going to be moving my brush in a way that recreates the movement along the surface, back towards the wall. I can use a variety of strokes, but I want to put the paint down so that there's, there's no way the paint's application is going to reinforce that flat surface. I want everything I do in making this painting, I want to do in such a way that I in working to, in a, in a way, eliminate the flat plane of the canvas and create a believable 
um, space that that column is sitting. So also notice that I'm not being precious about the contour lines of the cone I drew, because I can always get those back. And I want to make sure that I'm blocking in my paint right, right smack up to the edge of the contour draw line, the contour line of the cone that I've drawn. I don't want to leave a little space of blank canvas between the cone and the background. Sometimes I'll see people do that. Um, People, I, I think, get um, hesitant about um, destroying their drawings. So they leave a little space of canvas. You don't want to do that. You want to um, very assertively block in the background right up to the surface of the drawing. But if you mess up your contour line a little bit, you can always get that back. So a very simple. Uh, a very simple value for the plane of the back wall and the plane of the surface that the cone is sitting on. Now, notice I've left this cast shadow blank. That's really important. You don't want, you always want to paint shadow and light areas as separate areas of paint. You don't want to try to put down the light over the whole thing and then paint the shadow back into that light. Because what will happen if I try to paint a darker value into wet paint, the wet paint lightens the value so I can't really get it as dark as I want. So you want to make sure to paint lights and shadows always as separate areas. So now I'm going to ask myself, what's the value of that cast shadow compared to the value of the light parts of the tabletop surface? So that's a, a darker value still. So we use a slightly smaller brush. And I'm going to block in, again, very simply. I'm going to block in that cast shadow. So remember, we're looking for those elements of light and shadow. So light mass, dark mass, form shadow, and here, cast shadow. So now, OK, so I have a very simple statement, a very simple block in of that cast shadow. What's not quite right about the cast shadow as I've painted it? Like what, what characterizes a cast shadow? What do you, looking at um, the image of the still life I'm working from, what's not, what am I not seeing about the cast shadow? So I've blocked it in very simply. I've blocked in that very simple shadow shape. What's it missing? What's, what's not quite right about this edge, the division between the cast shadow and the light side of the, the light side of the, um... Um, looking at the image, it looks like the shadow is also on the light side a little bit. You mean, okay, so you mean as the tabletop goes backwards, it gets a little bit darker back here? Um, no, like on the right side, it looks like there's a little shadow that goes onto the light part. 
Oh, back here. Yeah. Oh, that's true. In like that corner. Uh, there's a kind of, that's very subtle, so I'm not, I'm not gonna put that in right now. Okay. But you're right, you're right. I mean, you could start to indicate those. Those are subtle things. Normally I wouldn't put that in, but you're right. It gets a little bit darker here. And we can start to indicate that. I'm gonna be very, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really be subtle about that. Like I don't wanna overstate that. But you start to get a little bit of darkness here. And we actually, now that you've mentioned that, the tabletop is lighter here than it is here. Do you see that? And, and that's also something, we can do that. I, I, normally I wouldn't, I don't think I would do that at this point, but we could start to indicate that. So I can take some light and lighten this part of the, so I don't want to overstate that at all. I don't want to make too dramatic a difference because it's actually pretty subtle. So it does get slightly darker as the tabletop goes back. And I can start to indicate that. And that's actually helpful. That's actually helping me do that because that's going to help us make the cash out of a little bit so as I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, it's called feathering out. So I've made this a little bit lighter and I'm going to let that soften into the darker part of it back here. I'm going to feather that in. So what I'm doing is I'm barely touching the surface of the paint, just like scrubbing those different values together. Um, I can start indicating that. That's helpful. Um, what do you, like, if we look at the edge between this shadow and the light part of the table, what's different in the image you're looking at? There's, like, a second lighter shadow behind the other yeah. darker shadow. It's not, a, it's not a second shadow, exactly. It's a kind of half tone as that shadow, because, because the division between the cast shadow and the light isn't um, completely, isn't a, isn't a sharp transition. And you want to, I uh, want to notice that. So you want to notice those half tones. So there's a softness to this edge. So I'm, I'm seeing the division between light and shadow. But I also want to notice that soft, the softness of this edge. So it isn't a sharp edge. So we're going to give these, in order to give those um, transitions or that sense of light and shadow a believability, you want to indicate the light and shadow with the clarity that it has. So there's an absolute clarity between the lights and the shadows, but at the same time, you want to um, indicate the, the softness of those shadow edges. So that we believe those transitions. It's kind of softness in that shadow edge. I want the shadow to read clearly, but I also want to have that softness that's there. Uh, professor, uh -huh. what is the stick tool that you're using? Yeah. So this is called a. Um, this is common for artists to use. So what you do is you, so that you're not touching your painting, but you have some control of the hand. You rest it on your easel, or you can rest it on top of your painting, and then you just rest your hand on that on the stick. So this is called a mall stick, M-A-H-L. Um, and you can buy them in an art supply store. It costs about 25 bucks. The ones you buy at an art supply store usually come in three segments. So you can take them apart and carry them with you easily. This is just a dowel that I bought in the hardware store. But it's just like a, a wooden dowel like this. You know, any hardware store, you can go in and get these dowels. 
and this probably cost two or three bucks. Um, and uh, this is one that I've used for years, so it has like paint on it and stuff. But I, you know, I always paint with that. So I don't ask people to buy them, but they're very useful. We'll soften that edge. Thanks. I'm going to take a, um, a soft brush. Um, and I'm going to use that soft brush to just blend this together. So I can give people um, suggestions for something like this as a blending tool uh, for anybody who's interested in it. Again, I don't require that people buy them because not everybody's necessarily interested in that kind of painting and I want to keep the cost down. But for anybody who's interested in this, I'll send people a link with a couple suggestions for useful brushes to blend with. So just on that topic, um, bl useful blending brushes are things like this. Again, for anybody who wants to um, invest in them. So um, these ones here, those are called fan brushes. Um, and then these ones here are actually water, uh, watercolor brushes, but they look a little bit like makeup brushes. But these are all very useful for blending. So if anybody wants any information on that, I'll send some links. Um, you can also get these kinds of brushes for that. Um, Professor, I had a question. Um, so how long does it take for the paint to dry? Like how long do we have to work with it? It'll take a day or two. Okay. okay. So, um, you know, if I wanted to start like knitting that back, or I could start just with this fan brush, just starting to do that. You don't want to overdo it at the beginning. So you don't want you don't want to over smooth things. Okay. So now we have a decent, I think, block in of the background and the cast shadow. Um, I'm going to do a couple of small um, you know, sort of details to start to give the painting a little bit of, we'll start to move away from that uh, over the simple. So there's a, a little cast shadow on a piece of paper. So I'll put that in. So as the paper. Okay, so now, so I have the background and the cast shadow blocked in. So now I'm going to look at, remember, I'm going to, we're looking at lights and shadows, and I'm going to look at the value of the dark side of the comb. Actually, why don't we take a 10 minute break? Um, people asked about a break. Um, usually I take a 15 or 20 minute break, but since we started late today, let's just do a 10 minute break. Um, I'm going to start painting again at exactly 440, okay? So we'll just break for a few minutes, okay? Class goes until 5.30, right? That's the end time, yeah. Yes.
Okay, you guys can hear me, right? Okay, so um, I'm now going to move on, as I said before the break, to uh, blocking in the, the overall simple average value of the bit. So if you look, if you look at the object in the image I sent you, you can see that there's more than just one value in the shadow side. There are multiple values in there. But again, I'm going to try to build this painting from very simple masses to the more complex. So I'm going to look at that shadow mass, and I'm just going to assign it kind of overall average value. So actually, I don't know. I'm not sure if you can see this in image I sent. Actually, I want to see. I'm just looking at the image I sent you. Yeah, okay, so look at the image I sent you. Do you notice how the value of the shadow is pretty much exactly the same value as the table behind the cone right here. So this value and this value are about the same. So I'm going to use that value, that same value I mixed up for the tabletop to paint the shadow value of the cone. So again, I'm just going to block that in. Very, very broad. So I'm just finding one simple value for that shadow side. And remember, it's about the shadow, the value of the shadow side of the cone is about the same value as the tabletop just behind me. So I'm just blocking this all in. Initially, with one very simple value. Uh, one of the students is locked outside. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so uh, I think that's about the right value for the shadow side of the object. Now I'm going to, before I get into the lights, I'm just going to clarify one thing. So remember we, when we were talking about the elements of light and shadow, we talked about the form shadow, the shadow on the, on the, on the form itself. We talked about the cast shadow. And then we talked about something that we call either the shadow accent or the occlusion shadow. So those are the very darkest shadows where almost no light is getting. So there's no direct light, there's no reflected light. And so there aren't a lot, there's not a lot of occlusion shadow in this setup, but there is an occlusion shadow actually right underneath the cone, a kind of dark line just underneath the cone, there's almost no light in it. 
And then there's a subtle occlusion shadow where contour of the cone meets the um, meets the cast shadow. So it's just a kind of darker area of shadow. Just, just to the right of the cone where it, where it meets the, the cash shadow. So I just want to put that in. Yeah, give a little more complexity and subtlety. Now, uh, now I want to block in an equally simple large mass for the light side of that cone. So that the light side of that cone is very light. So I'm going to mix up a value. So that that cone is nearly white, but it's not quite white. What I'm going to do? I'm going to put down some pure white. Where the highlight is. And I'm going to use that to gauge the value of the cone, the, 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 light, the light mass of the cone. So the light mass of the cone should be nearly white, but not quite white. So, and again, I'm not looking at any subtlety. I'm not looking at little details. If there's a little wrinkle in the paper surface of the cone, I'm not going to bother with that here. I'm just looking at big light and dark masses, big light and dark values. So I think that value of the light side of the cone is about something like that. And I picked that in very broadly. Very simple, large mass. Again, ignoring any details. The details are not, not important here, not important right now. I just want to establish a big convincing series of relationships between the values that I see up in the center. Very simple masses of lights and shadows. So what, okay, so now we have, now we have everything masking. We have all of our lights and darks. Now what, so we have a good start, a good um, big statement of the, of the large light and dark value relationships. What seems to be lacking though? Can anyone, like looking at the image and then looking at our painting, what seems to be lacking? Like what, what's something that we could start adding to this painting? 
you get more subtlety, you get more believability. Could it be the cast shadow? I'm sorry? Could it be the cast shadow? That well, this is the cast shadow, right? Is that what you mean? Yes. Well, well the cast shadow, I, I, I'm going to leave that for now. I want to work on some other things. Like, what else uh, does the painting need? Maybe a, a little bit more light. A little bit more light. You mean a little bit more complexity in the light or more variety in the light? Maybe. I, I meant like to the corner, like bottom left, maybe. No, well, I do think there needs more information in the light. I think actually in the painting in general, we just need to find some more information. I think have a very simple block here. I think a very useful block here. But it's also very simple. But it's a little bit flat. A little bit oversimplified. Does anyone remember what are the elements of light and shadow that you talked about? Like, does anyone, anyone remember any of those elements of light and shadow that we can start to look for and find in the painting? You could add like half tones. Half tone. Right. So that's the first thing I would look for. So the division between the dark and the light is a little bit abrupt, isn't it? It's a little bit too sharp. You think that's true? So I'm going to look for the half tone. So I want to bring in a half tone that's going to make that form roll around in space in a little bit more of a subtle, a little bit more of a convincing way. So I'm going to mix up a value that's between the dark and the light. So what's that value? It's going to be about a middle gray value. The half tone is incredibly important. So I don't want the transition from light to dark to be just a sharp line. I want it to be, I want it to be clear. I don't want it to be a kind of like Photoshop gradation where you can't tell the difference between the light and the shadow. At the same time, I want it to be subtle, and I want it to be the kind of transition that you see on a round form, such as the one we're doing. So I've mixed up a middle tone, a tone between the light and the dark, and I'm just laying that tone in along the shadow edge, bringing in that half. And so that half tone is just transitioning, it's rolling that shadow into the light. So that transition starts to seem round like it is. And I'm going to feather that half tone into the light. Soft transition. Over the light back into that half tone. And I can take one of my blending brushes and I can start softening. So now we've indicated the half tone. I could work on that more. It's not, not, I could continue to make that more subtle. But what's another, so we talked about the light, the light, the dark, the light mass, the dark mass, the cast shadow, which we've got. 
We started to indicate the occlusion shadow. We've brought in some of the half tone. What's another element of light and shadow that we talked about? Maybe the highlights? There is highlight, right? So we could, I, I wouldn't paint the highlight now, but there is highlight, so we might as well do that. So um, the highlight, So where's the highlight? I see the highlight running right around here. It's about a third of the way over from the left-hand contour. So I'm going to get a little bit more of white paint. I'm going to paint a highlight right in the white. The highlight is starts to fade off as we get down to the bottom of the cone. So I'm looking carefully where on the form the highlight is. And now I'm going to start to pay attention to how softly it transitions into the center light around it. So it's not just a, it's not a sharp band of light. It blends in, it softens into the center light around it. So the main light source we often call the center light. And the center light, and then there's the highlight. What's another element of light and shadow? So we have the light mass, dark mass, we have the highlight. Uh, reflected light. Reflected light. So we want to find the reflected light in the core of the shadow.
So before I do that, I'm just softening some of these transitions a little bit. Just going in and softening that half tone transition. So you want a soft transition, but you, but you still want to maintain the clarity of light and shadow. You want to bring in that half tone. Now, so I need to bring in, I need to, I need to, indicate that there's a reflected light there. So one option is to make the shadow a little bit lighter, where I'm seeing the reflected light. But I can also possibly, depending on um, what I need to do, or depending on the specifics of my painting, I may be able to make that reflected light by actually bringing in the core of the shadow. So remember, the core of the shadow is that darker band of shadow along the shadow edge, or along that terminal. And since my, when I look at my setup, or if you look at your image, the, the reflected light value is the same as the surface of the table behind the car. Those are the same value. And right now in my painting, the reflected light value of the call is the same as the, the surface of the table behind it. So I'm not going to lighten the reflected light. I'm actually going to darken the core of the shadow. And by doing that, create that sense of the reflected light. So I'm going to make the reflected light, I mean the core of the shadow in my painting, just a little bit darker than the reflected light. So I need to mix just slightly darker, a value just slightly darker than the reflected light value. And I'm going to just sort of touch that in or scrub that in. So it's just, it's just that band of shadow. It's just a little bit darker than the reflected light. And so I'm feathering that in, just like I feathered in those other tones, or trying to feather it in. And now we're starting to get, now we're starting to get a, a real sense of this form wrapping around the space, right? As we start to progressively add those elements of light and shadow. Volume more and more convincingly starts to wrap around in space. Well, I can continue to refine this more and more. 
so the, the the value the values are a little bit choppy somewhere like right here I don't like that little chop of value um, you know and I would continue to work on this um, I'll bring in I'll emphasize a little bit more strongly I like And at this point, we have all of the main elements of the lights and shadows blocked in. So I'll continue now to refine them. Um, I can also now start to look for any subtlety in the um, setting around the, the still light. I would start to try to get rid of this slightly darker halo. I would just continue now to refine all the values as much as it's possible. So the The left hand contour of the cone is a little wobbly, so I'll try to straighten that.
And, uh, but I'm not going to torture you along the way. I would certainly work on it a little, a little while longer. But that's, those are the basic elements we want to look for. So again, you want to, so the painting to do for next week, you want to set up you know, a simple situation like, like I have here. Um, That's a bad image. Um, and try to do as accurate a, a painting of the values that you see in the setup as you can. Okay. Remembering to start with um, as accurate a proportional drawing as the setup, and then carefully observing um, the values of lights and darks um, in the setup in front of you. Does that make sense? And this will be a little bit of a, um, an ex we'll see how, how, how much work people are able to get done. Um, so is that clear for next week, the assignment for next week? Are there any questions about Anything at all, the, the, what's expected in the assignment, about materials or anything else? I'm still trying to get a cone because um, they were sold out on Blick. Okay. Do, does, did other people have trouble getting a cone? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I'll do is I will... Um, I'm going to email everybody a... I'm going to email everybody a template. I actually made this cone. Um, this is not something I bought at Blick. I just, I used a template that you can get online and I cut out the template and then rolled the paper and I glued it along this edge. Um, so, Can, you can relatively easily um, make a cone. And what I actually used for the, um, the paper was uh, one of these file, sh um, file folders uh, because it, it's a stiff, it's a good stiff paper um, to use to make the cone. Um, so I'll send people the template, okay? So you just trace that template on a sheet of paper, cut it out, roll it, and glue it. Um, the other thing people can do if those options don't work is you can get a paper cup like this. So a, you know, it has to be a, it, it, does, it can't be plastic because the, the light won't work on that. But if you get a, a, a white paper cup like this, that's a pretty good stand-in for a cone, right? So um, that, that will work. It's not ideal, but that will work. Um, so there are options. So I, I will send that template tonight. If you don't get the template from me by tomorrow, please email me, okay? Um, any other questions or? Um, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you're going to, um, upload the recording to Blackboard? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That, it, you know, it's actually a little bit, it's not totally automatic. So it, it'll, cause I have to actually turn it into a YouTube video. And, and then upload it to Blackboard. Otherwise, uh, otherwise I, I, I go over the data limit on Blackboard too quickly. So I'll, I'll have it uploaded by tomorrow. Okay, but I, I probably won't have it uploaded by tonight. Oh, I'm sorry, I have a question. Sure. So we're supposed to do this on the canvas, right? 
on a canvas board. Yeah. Okay, but I haven't gotten my supplies yet. Like I already ordered them, so, but I don't know when they're gonna arrive. So maybe is it possible I could get an extension only for the first assignment? Yeah, if anybody has a problem with supplies, you can get an extension. Yeah, I, I know that. Yeah, I realize this this is not ideal situation. Yeah, so just just keep me updated. Okay, so should I email you? Yeah, yeah just email me. Let me know what's going on. Okay, and this okay. is going on. I'm sorry. Uh, you're. It keeps cutting in and out. It's going on the canvas. Uh, which canvas did you want it on? Did you? Preferably a canvas board. Okay. Um, okay. Is it all right if I have a, just an actual canvas? If you have a what? An actual canvas. Yeah, that's fine. A, a, you mean a stretch canvas? Mm hmm Yeah, that's totally fine. Thank if you. People, if people want to do it on stretch canvas, that's fine. Okay, so just let me know if, if people have other questions. You can feel free to email me, obviously. Um, and again, if, if, if you don't get the, um, the cone um, template by tomorrow, just email me to remind me. Okay, so if there aren't any other questions, I'll just end it here and we'll see each other next week. Have a good night. Okay, have a great week, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a Doodles. Good